And good evening, I'm Errol Laborde. Marcia is off tonight. A rather mild gubernatorial election may be a welcome alternative to what has so far been a dizzying football season. We'll look at both tonight, as well as key legislative races, an outbreak of shootings, understanding the state's economy, a church scandal arrest, and the Pelicans take the court. Starting for us at tonight's informed sources, Tyler Bridges, reporter for the Times-Picayune New Orleans Advocate, Ramon Antonio Vargas of the Picayune and Advocate, Fletcher Mackle, sports reporter, WDSU-TV, Channel 6, and Stephanie Grace, political columnist, also with the Picayune and Advocate. So, two weeks from uh, tomorrow is the gubernatorial election. Stephanie, how do we stand right now? Well, I think the big question right now is, does it end two weeks from tomorrow? <laughs> does John Bell Edwards, the incumbent, get... 50% plus one. That's the magic number that would allow him to win, win in the primary and not have to ha go into runoff in November. He has two major Republican uh, c challengers, Eddie Rusponi, a businessman from Baton Rouge, Ralph Abraham, a congressman from North Louisiana. And they're in a really interesting position. They're in a tough position because they, you know, think about the president ele presidential election. You have a primary, then you have a general. So you fight amongst yourself, people in your party, and then you face the other party. They have to do it all at once. There's, there's a second spot if it goes to a runoff. One of them can get, and they're very close in the polls. They've been kind of going back and forth. And they also have to, so they have to be fighting each other, and they also have to have have to look at John Bell Edwards and try to knock him down below 50%. Yeah, and didn't, didn't uh, Ralph Abraham in the debate last night talked he, about that? Where he, he did. He said, hey, you, you know, you're going after me. We, should, we, we need should, to be going to the guy. What about that guy? Yeah. Yes. But, I mean, he's going after Rispone, too, you should we should point out, and Rasponi has spent a lot more money, his own money. But essentially, Rasponi and Abraham are running against each other right they now. They are, and also running against that number, that 50% number. So at the debate last night, this was the second debate, um, each candidate had an opportunity to ask the other another a question, and what Eddie Rasponi did was he repeated the theme of one of his ads, which is to Ralph Abraham, why did you say that... Uh, President Trump should step down from the Republican ticket after the Access Hollywood tape came out. And why are, he didn't mention Nancy Pelosi, but in answering it, Ralph Abraham noted that in, um, Rispone had also accused him of being too close to Nancy Pelosi, noting a certain number of votes they took together. Now, those are votes that are 100 percent. I mean, they are not close at all. And so they really got into it a little bit. And then at the end of the exchange, Abraham was like, wait, that guy, we're supposed to be fighting that guy. And in conservative politics, Nancy Pelosi is sort of like an all-purpose boogeyman or yeah, boogie woman, like boogie they're woman, going to call yeah. it. And so the, they really use her for yeah. political advantage. And, and they, they do. And, you know, the other kind of boogeyman in this race is Bobby Jindal. And that's and Bob, John Bell Edwards is using Bobby Jindal as a boogeyman. And um, he had the opportunity to kind of ding Eddie Rispone for having been a big supporter of Bobby Jindal. And Rispone stepped back a little and said, you know, I uh, he's not on the ballot, I am. And... I didn't support him for president, so Good. And not Tal many people did, I should add. Yeah, yeah. So. And, Tal and Tali, you've been following the race. Uh, How does it look to you? Same thing? Or, uh... Yeah, it looks like, uh, Errol, it's about 50-50 chance that John Bell Edwards will win re-election on October 12th. And as mm -hmm. she said, that if, if he can't get above that 50% mark, we'll see who finishes the second. Right. But, uh, uh, the Republicans have been saying that, uh, that the estate economy has not been growing fast enough under John Bell Edwards, that uh, he has created a bad business climate through the taxes that were raised to eliminate the budget deficit that he inherited from Bobby Jindal. Uh, and Which is also, now a surplus. Okay. Yeah. Well, we can talk about the economy a little bit later, too, but I want to do that. But look, what they're both hoping for, all right, if you do get into a runoff where you mm -hmm. have, we, we all agree that, that Edwards is going to lead the voting, sure. the first thing, and maybe one of these people will make the runoff, but whoever that is, there's going to be a big gap between first place there and second is. place. So, that, and their hope is that Trump can come in and make a difference. Right. But, but can Trump turn that around? Well, but one way to look at that is, <clears throat> it's a referendum on John Bell Edwards. So he either gets the majority or he doesn't. So if the other vote is split between two Republicans, you, you think most of it will go to the one Republican. So that's one point. So it probably would be a close race. 
I think Trump is an interesting question because both Republicans would love for him to come and do a big rally. They've been competing also over who is more loyal to Trump. I think the timing's interesting because we have this impeachment inquiry now and is does Trump still go out on rallies? Does he still have the same cachet among that part of the vote that he, he did? I, I don't know. Or I think an Eddie Rasponi saying that he agrees with everything Donald Trump has done and he's 100% yeah. him. You know, right. and we know that Eddie Rasponi's numbers went up, his negative numbers went up after he tied himself so closely to Trump in the ads, introducing himself to Louisiana voters. So Trump could be a bit more toxic, and that maybe that will boomerang a bit in this it race. It might. Okay. And, you know, there's something quickly that John Bell Edwards said in a Washington Post story that came out, which is, I don't know that he'd come because he likes to win, mm -hmm. and, you know, he could come here and they could lose, so he kind of almost dared him to. Could I ask a follow-up? I apologize sure. to both of you. If John Bell doesn't win in the primary, mm -hmm. does it then become, I don't want to say a dire situation, but a, a scary situation for him given to it, what you just said that you would assume in a ruby red state that the rest of that right. Republican vote would go towards. So does he almost have to win in the primary or no? I, I, think, I think almost, not definitely, but I think you're, there's a lot to that because, again, this is a referendum on the guy that people know, John Bell Edwards, the guy who's been in office for four years. And if he doesn't get half the vote, that means more than half the people who showed up to vote don't want him returned. So that's a pretty strong signal. And again, the more this becomes about party, the more it disadvantages him. He's been working very hard to say, everything I did, I did with, a bi with bipartisan support, which he had to do because the legislature is Republican. And one thing and, he has going for him this, this time around, he didn't have four years ago, as you know, Stephanie, is that he has the New Orleans delegation, which is the, the, the parish that will that. has the biggest Democratic vote. It's united behind him, and he certainly did not have that four years ago. Well, if there's one institution that has 100% unity, it's the Saints. Mm -hmm. Can I tell you, Fletcher, we're only in the fourth week of the Saints season, mm -hmm. and I'm already emotionally exhausted. I mean, how about you? <laughs> I mean, for that first game against Houston, to going to the Rams, and, the, and Drew Brees getting hurt in that Seattle game. And we still got, what, 15 games left or something? Yeah, but, 13 games. But, but how do you feel at the Saints at this point now? I feel confident about the Saints. I think that the win in Seattle was a milestone for this organization because it's always been Drew Brees and the rest of the team has gotten credit, but maybe not the credit that it deserves. And Drew Brees deserves a lot of credit. He's the greatest player in franchise history without question. And there have been times that he has had to put this franchise on his back and carry it to a 7-9 and nine record when without him they may have been 4-12. and 12. But I think going to Seattle, they hadn't won there since 2007. I've covered games there. It is an insane atmosphere and it's a tough place to play in wet conditions. Alvin Kamara is a great player. Michael Thomas is a great player. Cam Jordan's a great player. I think they proved to themselves that, yes, Drew's important, but we have a great team top to bottom without Drew. Not to say that they're looking past Drew. He's coming back. He's still going to be a really good player. But I think it proved to them not two or three games without Drew they finally got a win because we knew Seattle and Dallas without Drew are going to be hard. They did Their first win without Drew wasn't Tampa that's kind of down and out. They went to a tough place against a good team facing a coach that had never lost a home game in September since he got there in 2010, and they won, and they did it in a team effort. So I, I'm It was really a bigger win than the score indicated. Without question, yeah. yeah. The, I mean, Seattle scored late. It, w it wasn't yeah. as close as the score would indicate. It wasn't a pretty win. Uh, let's make no mistake. I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't exactly pretty. But winning without Drew Brees is important, and they showed they can do it. Um, Dallas is going to be much more difficult, but I do think the Saints are going to be one of the teams right there at the top of the NFC when when the season ends, and I do think they have a really great team and a chance to get to the Super Bowl, even without Drew Brees for six weeks. What if six weeks into it, and Bridgewater's having a fabulous season? It doesn't matter. And Drew Brees is ready. It doesn't matter. Drew Brees comes doesn't back matter. Drew Brees comes back. This is unlike any other situation. Sean Payton, Mickey Loomis, Drew Brees, we're not talking about any other player. We're talking about one of the greatest quarterbacks ever, the greatest player in franchise history. Teddy Bridgewater can be 6-0, and and they'll say, thank you, Teddy, and shake his hand and put the baseball cap back on. And he may have won the job in the future. With right. Th then he'll prove that maybe right. he's Drew Brees' heir apparent, or he'll make himself a lot of money in the yeah. offseason with another team. Right. But make no mistake, they hope he goes 6-0, and and when he comes back, he's going right back to being... Yeah the backup, and, and everybody knows that, and it is not up for debate in any way, shape, or form. Okay. Well, Ramon, less uh, happy subject here is that mm -hmm. there's been a lot of violence. I mean, there's always been some, mm -hmm. but there were a lot of shootings last weekend. 
at a lot of different spots. And people, it's, it's like drive-by shootings. I mean, what's happening? Overall, the uh, violent crime number of shootings and, um, and murders are, uh, are, are both down, uh, which seems counter counterintuitive given, given um, the, the 14 people who were shot across several inc incidents uh, between Friday and, uh, and Saturday last week. And then it's spilled into Monday at the beginning of this week when, uh, when three more people were shot. Um, so overall, um, the city is actually on pace for another significant reduction in, in murders to last year when they had um, when they had the lowest number of uh, of murders in the city since 1971. Um, at the same time, I mean, last weekend was a was a reminder that even when the city is having a a peaceful or uh, a less violent year by city standards, um, that the city continues for whatever reason twice a year, three times a year to have these uh, these very intense spasms of, of gun violence in which a lot of people get shot and uh, and there's a lot of, and a lot of different incidents um, in, a, in a short period of time uh, you know the police were able to make uh, arrests and, and probably two of the, the higher profile ones um, one was the was the killing of a teenager at the corner of uh, of canal and um, uh, uh, canal city park uh, and there, you know, I, I was never able to really confirm. There was some speculation that maybe the, the kids had been that something had happened at a, at a nearby football game. And um, but anyway, the, the those kids were leaving uh, the, a football game apparently, and uh, and then were shot by another young person who uh, who was arrested in Saint Bernard and uh, and has been kept there since his arrest. Uh, and then the other one was a uh, was a shooting, and I think which which you mentioned, um, you know, it it, it was a, it was like a rolling shootout. Um, the, the next day that uh, and, and people several people who weren't involved um, were injured whether it was a cyclist who got hit by the car uh, somebody who was grazed by a bullet working at a, at a seafood restaurant relatively close to to where the rolling shootout kind of ended um, which I think I mean it's 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 what's frightening that that even even when when violence is uh, is when when the the violent crime numbers look encouraging by city standards uh, that that uh, violence can still hit close to home. If someone in an automobile goes after somebody else in an automobile, is it more likely to assume that they all knew each other, that there's some kind of thing going on? So in, in that case, um, I, I don't know how well they knew each other. There was, uh, in, in the court documents, there was a description of, of at least a dispute that had begun the prior night um, that they, they might have not, I, it wasn't clear if the, if, the, if the people involved knew each other from for weeks or years or whatever it may be, but at least that it was linked to some dispute that happened the prior night that they then allegedly encountered each other um, and it devolved to the next day and it devolved into this uh, this rolling shootout that uh, that ended up injuring uh, people that were just out on their Saturday morning. So at least that might enable the police to make an arrest because the people who were injured when that killed could say, well, yeah, that was so-and-so. Yes, uh, this was uh, one of... Um, they, they were actually able to, to make an, an arrest when one of the people that was participating and wounded uh, showed up at the hospital. And, uh, uh, and that also happened, uh, that happened on both sides of, of the gun battle where people who were injured showed up at the hospital. And so they were able to kind of make a case, um, okay. case on that front. So. Well, Tyler, battles of different sorts, going back to the governor's race for a second, is that we're, um, when the candidates talk, they talk about how great the economy is or how bad the economy is. And it's hard to tell, is it good or bad? What have you learned about the Louisiana economy. What's the truth? <laughs> well, yes. <laughs> what is the truth? Well, the truth depends on where you sit. Where you sit. Well, you're sitting right there, so tell us the truth. <laughs> yeah. So, if you're John Bell Edwards, obviously you want to talk about how good the economy is, and you focus on the state's unemployment rate, which has gone from 6.3 percent uh, when he took office to 4.3 percent. He likes to say that's the 11th or 12th. Yes, it's the lowest in 11 or 12 years but a different measure, the number of jobs that have been created, which is a different way of measuring. Uh, Louisiana is actually down since he took office, and this has allowed Republicans to say that Louisiana has the worst performing economy since, uh, since he became governor. And, uh, and another point that John Bill Edwards focuses on is the deficit that he inherited from Bobby Jindal. Uh, two billion dollar deficit, and now it is uh, uh, a surplus of about 500 million. So each side wanting to make its case will will cite a different set of statistics. But what could be said, like from a national perspective, if people are looking at Louisiana, trying to decide if they want to live here, if they want to invest, is this a state that's economically viable now? Depends on where you sit. Okay. John Bell Edwards has said, will say that people are better off than they were four years ago when he took office. 
that uh, he's investing in the future. There's more money for higher education after the years of budget cuts by Bobby Jindal, that there's some more money for early childhood education in the last budget. Republicans are saying, well, all those taxes that were raised are scaring away businesses and they don't want to invest here. Um, so again, it's, it's, it, I don't think it's a clear-cut picture. It really depends on what statistics you want to look but at. But the fact is, when he became governor, it was a pretty dreary situation. Uh, the state was was really in bad shape financially, and they had all those legislative sessions back to back to back to back, and they had to really raise a lot of money. Yeah, well, the, clearly the, the one area where the governor can have the biggest impact is with the budget, and he said he did have to call all those special sessions. He kept trying to get the Republicans and the conservative Republicans in the House to support enough tax increases, uh, particularly sales tax, to be able to uh, end the, the budget problems, and they have succeeded in doing that. Now there are Republicans who say, well, you succeeded too well, you raised <laughs> taxes too much because of the amount of the surplus. Um, so, um, it, and the one, last time we had a big surplus and they cut taxes a lot, that helped get us into the situation mm -hmm. with Jindal. Yeah, in fact, I think you asked the governor the question the other day when, when, when yes. we had a meeting at the Advocate about that. I did, yes. You know, another matter is yesterday you broke two stories dealing with the gubernatorial election. One, tell us about it. Sure. One is a, a story I, I worked on with my colleague, Sam Carlin. We've been working on it for a long time about Ralph Abraham, the doctor, candidate for governor, congressman from northeast Louisiana. And we had fig figures showing them uh, that he was in, uh, wrote a lot of uh, prescriptions for opioids. And uh, my colleague, Sam Carlin, interviewed uh, Dr. Abraham. Again, he's a member of the Congress now. And he said that he actually wrote a lot of prescriptions because he, he saw a lot of patients and so as a result he wrote a lot of opioids but uh, I interviewed uh, a couple of doctors independent doctors who are experts in the subject and they said they thought he actually did write a lot of he did prescribe a lot of opioids uh, that was one of the stories I broke the An other. unusually lot of opioids or unexpected he was, amount? Uh, across compared to all doctors nationwide in a particular category he was in the top 0 0.2 percent wow which is very, very high. Okay, and the other story? The other story was uh, a, about a, a settlement in principle uh, that would be the first one between one of the oil and gas companies that have been sued by the coastal parishes. That company is Freeport MacMoran, has reached an agreement with uh, the, law, the lawyers representing the parishes. Uh, Freeport MacMoran has agreed to pay up to $100 million that would go for restoring the coast. And the, the lawyers representing the coast Coastal parishes hope that this would serve as a template that that uh, now a bunch of other companies will come in and and pay hundreds of millions billions of dollars that would go for the coast because it's not clear where the money would come mm -hmm. from because uh, the lawmakers don't want to raise taxes on the people of Louisiana and they certainly don't want to pay more taxes to fix the coast. And, and this has been a gubernatorial issue yeah. too because John Bell Edwards has supported these suits and mm -hmm. his opponents have criticized him for yeah. them. Yeah. Ramon, earlier um, this year you won, uh, you reported on the uh, that, that day when the church revealed the uh, a list of priests and clergy uh, for whom there was, they said, credible evidence of some sort of a of sexual activity, and but there never has been an arrest until this past week, and this was a, a deacon. Yes, it was. Uh, it was Deacon George Brignac, who uh, of the of the people on on that list. Um, you know, to, to use a term, I guess, um, to, for lack of a better term, I guess one of the more infamous cases. Uh, my colleague uh, Jim Mushin reported a lot on it um, before the list came out, um, and it was uh, it's George Brignac who had been accused. Uh, three uh, had been arrested uh, in connection with uh, child molestation allegations uh, three three different times over the years and between like starting in like the 1970s to um, uh, into the 1980s and was even tried once but uh, but acquitted uh, and then uh, the other two arrests didn't lead to uh, didn't lead to criminal charges um, despite that when the uh, the the clergy abuse crisis at the Catholic Church reignited last year uh, for many reasons, one of them being the, the Pennsylvania grand jury report um, uh, that came out last summer that exposed hundreds of cases that, uh, that hadn't been previously heard of. Um, uh, several people came forward uh, with, with allegations against Brignac. Uh, separately, uh, the church had settled uh, for, for at least six figures uh, in 500, at least 500,000, but the figures believed to be higher. Uh, settled a, a abuse claim dating back to the 1980s, uh, around the time that he was facing criminal charges. Uh, another another molestation case. Um, 
people came forward with with additional allegations uh, against uh, George Brignac, and he was uh, and and one of those people that came forward. It was in fact the same one that received the settlement that I mentioned. Um, pressed uh, pressed a, a case with the with the New Orleans Police Department, and the uh, the New Orleans Police Department arrested him um, last Saturday on a uh, on account of first degree rape. Um, that that charge is significant because uh, it carries a mandatory life sentence upon conviction and has no statute of limitations. Um, and, and so, which means it can be tried no matter how long ago the, uh, the allegations happened. Uh, and, and that is something that the, there's a big fight in, in, on the civil aspect of, of all these cases where people are suing for damages about whether they've waited too long to file a lawsuit because of the statute of limitations. But, this doesn't, um, but that doesn't apply in, in the criminal case that, uh, that began last week with the, with the, well, I mean, it really started with, uh, with an investigation dating back to last year, but that culminated in his arrest last Saturday. Um, so it, it was significant because, like you said, there, there hadn't been any law enforcement action taken against anybody on that credibly accused list that you mentioned that the Archdiocese released on November 2nd, and, and 2018. He's, he's 83 years old. 84. He's, he's 84 years old, so uh, that's obviously a factor about how, how quickly to proceed. Um, it, it remains to be seen, you know, there, there's some thinking that maybe, um, you know, a lot of the times when you kind of have these parallel civil criminal cases, the criminal case results in a stay in the civil case. So, uh, you know, the idea of... Uh, on one hand, they're closer to justice in the in the criminal case, but on the civil case, um, there's there's a chance that any any cases against him may be stayed. I've been I've been keeping an eye about whether that's going to happen, um, and it just remains to be seen. Okay, well, Stephanie, in addition to the gubernatorial yeah. race, you've been looking at some of the key legislative races, and there are some uh, there are some important races here. There's a lot going on, especially Orleans Parish residents. Um, there's going to be a lot of turnover in the delegation, and a lot of it has to do with term limits. We've talked about that before. Orleans is losing three, really three of its most prominent legislators to term limits. Uh, J.P. Morrell from the Senate, Walt Leger from the House, and Neil Abramson from the House. And there are really competitive All races. very respected legislators, Very too. respective leadership positions, definitely. And they... Um, there are competitive races in all of them. J.P. Morrell's seat is interesting because two sitting House members are running, Joe Bowie and John Bagneris, so that means their seats are open up, so there are other competitive races for the House. Uh, Wesley Bishop, I should add, who's a state senator, decided not to run right before the election. Uh, his replacement just walked in, another, John, uh, John Harris, Jimmy Harris, another House member, so that's an open seat. Uh, the two uptown and, and other areas, but two seats that are kind of based uptown, Walt Leger and Neil Abramson, are, I'm gonna say, like, very, very competitive. I live in Neil Abramson's district, and there are seven candidates, and four anyway, maybe five, who are you know have raised a lot of money, have a lot of signs, are really well known in the community, you know, have been involved in all kinds of community organizations. Uh, you have some people in both districts who are um, women candidates running in this year when there's a real push to get more Democratic women. There are Democratic women. Um, so I think there are going to be runoffs. I think it's hard to predict who will be in some of these runoffs, but it will remain very competitive. Another race I wanted to talk about is in actually the district we're in right now. I drove by signs. Stephanie Hilferty is the incumbent. She's a Republican. It's a district that crosses Orleans and Jefferson. And she's Al along the lake. Along the lake, yes, along the levee, along the um, canal. And she is. Face, she's one of these moderate Republicans who would sometimes vote with John Bell Edwards, which means she's incurred the wrath of the more conservative Republicans. One of them is running against her, and there's also a Democrat, a pretty well-known Democrat, um, who actually ran against Steve Scalise last year. So it's it's a three-way, it's interesting. It could be somebody could win outright. It could be a two Republicans in the runoff. It could be a, you know, a Republican Democrat. The danger in our system is always that the person in the middle can get squeezed if there's too much support for one side or the other, even though she's the incumbent. I can envision Canal Boulevard and Harrison Avenue filled with, with, with so signs. So many signs, so, so many people, yes. Fletcher, as exciting as the football season is, the NBA season with the Pelicans is like really coming up soon. And there's like excitement unlike there's ever been before. Without question, look, I always joke with people that some people find God in their life. <laughs> in, in, I started working here at WDSU in 2002, and that was right when the NBA relocated here. And so I did not play basketball, but I have found the NBA and just love talking about it, love covering it. I think it's just the, the league itself is just on the way up because of the worldwide appeal and so many people in so many different countries can play basketball. But yes, there is a lot of excitement because 
for the first time that I can remember, it doesn't feel like this shaky house of cards that's about to get flicked down. You know, when George Shin came here with the Hornets, he was on shaky financial ground. He never really kind of righted the ship. He had to sell the team. There was talk of moving. The Bensons bought them, and in my opinion, saved basketball because had, had the Bensons not bought that franchise, it would have been hard to always compete with the Saints in LSU and the other endeavors in festivals that we have here. Um, but even they looked at it, and I think they would admit they walk a fine line now of maybe we should have cared about it a little bit more. Well, now I think they finally do by hiring David Griffin, by spending more money, by doing what they are doing now you kind of see the truth. Before, I think we all know BS. And, and it just felt like you're saying this, but the rhetoric doesn't match the reality. Now, the reality is they have strong people and they're financially invested in it and they are building something that, whether they win or lose, it's a little bit more sustainable and it's easy to believe in. And uh, and they've they've put together an exciting team. The Western Conference is as deep as I can ever remember. It's It's insanely ridiculous how deep it is and it's good because it's not just oh golden state's going to play in the finals you could literally say six teams are going to represent the western conference and i can make an argument for all six but the pelicans should be there in the mix for one of those final few playoff spots with zion in in the pieces they've put around them so it is football is exciting but this is the most excitement i felt about basketball in september maybe ever since imagine the team like got around here. january yeah. if the saints are playoff bound and if the Pelicans are playing really, really well, it could really, really be exciting. Sure, without question. It, it, it could be a really great sports year. LSU's got a great team. Yeah. Tulane, I think, is going to finish maybe 9-3 and three or 10-2. and two. The Saints are really good. The Pelicans can at least be good and push for a playoff spot. 2019-2020 could be a really special year for sports okay. in our area. Let's go through and ask you uh, what, what we should be looking forward to. Well, early voting begins tomorrow. Uh, it runs through October 5th. That will allow people to vote early in the October 12th primary. I always say that uh, people uh, get the government they deserve. So mm -hmm. people who don't vote, then nothing mm -hmm. to complain about. Remember they used to call it absentee voting, and now yeah. they call it early voting? Yep. Which I guess means you don't have to be absent. Right. You uh, have to yeah. certify that you can uh, To be able day. to vote. So, Ramon. Uh, lots of excitement about the Saints mm -hmm. and the Pels, but uh, don't forget October 26th, uh, New Orleans native Regis... Progray will be fighting for the uh, second piece of the 140-pound uh, um, class that he, 140-pound uh, division that he's in against uh, Scotland's Josh Taylor. Uh, it's also the World Boxing Super Series final. It will be at London's O2 Arena, um, which is a glitzy, glitzy venue, and it'll be uh, on DAZN, and we'll be covering it ahead of time. Okay, great. Fletcher? Um, I'm not looking that far ahead. My life is like day by day, so I'm saying Saints-Cowboys, huge matchup. I don't want to upset anybody. I think the Cowboys win, but I do think the Saints meet them again in the playoffs, neither the, the divisional round or the NFC Championship, and then get the best of the Cowboys once Drew Brees is back because the Cowboys are really good, and I just think that's going to be the only game Teddy Bridgewater loses while Brees is out. Okay, wow. okay. Uh, if you missed the first two gubernatorial debates, or even if you didn't and you want more, there's one more chance to see the three candidates together. It's October 9th on WVOE here in New Orleans, and that's three days before the election. So, okay. Uh, the other state, what? The other statewide elections. Uh, what's the most contested right now? Is it? Oh, a, really? None of them. I mean, I mean okay. There are candidates in yeah, every the statewide one, elections. But okay. okay. Incumbents should. All right. Well, whatever's happening, we'll be talking about it. Thanks to all of you for, uh, for joining us. Good show. Thanks for the panel. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.